what links sea cucumbers, the Korean demilitarised zone, and my mum? The answer is sand, gravel and mud. Areas of the seafloor, which are mostly made of sand, gravel and mud, are known as soft sediment habitats. And at first they can seem pretty bare and boring compared to hard substrate habitats like coral reefs. And let's be honest, nobody really likes sand. It's kind of coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere. And by everywhere, I literally mean over 50% of the Earth's surface. On this journey, we're going to explore the challenges of living in sand and mud and meet some of the remarkable animals who make a life for themselves here. We're going to go down to the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean and upwards out of the water as well. So if you're ready, let's take the plunge and explore the secret life of sand and mud. Welcome to the seafloor. This is known as the benthic zone, after the ancient Greek word benthos, meaning the depths. Far above us, in the pelagic zone, there are loads of animals who are great at swimming fast and floating along in the currents. Now, here on the seafloor, we have epifaunal animals who are resting just on top of the sediment, and far below our feet, we have the infaunal animals who like to dig and burrow. There's also a few guys who like to swim just above the bottom, but not quite on it. Those guys are called demersal. Typically, we might associate sand with the beach and shallow water, but sand and muddy habitats can be found all the way down to almost 11,000 metres in the Marianas Trench. About halfway down to these depths, between 3,000 and 6,000 metres, we encounter a very sandy and muddy place indeed, the Abyssal Plains. In some parts of the sea we have trenches or sea mounts and around the continents we have the continental shelf, but the vast majority of the ocean sea floor is this, the Abyssal Plains. Now not only are they the biggest habitat in the ocean, they're the biggest habitat on Earth. Abyssal Plains make up over 50% of the Earth's surface, which is crazy. These seemingly unremarkable areas of sand and mud are also the flattest areas on Earth, with a slope of less than one foot per 1,000 feet. Now that's even flatter than the Netherlands, take that Dutch people. Life on abyssal plains is defined by one main problem, finding food. At these depths, there's no light available for photosynthesis, and so the food chain has to start in two different ways. You can either get food from chemosynthesis at hydrothermal vents, or you can depend on garbage from above. When organisms in the sunlit water above die or excrete waste, it slowly sinks down to the benthic zone. Occasionally, a very, very large animal will die, but the majority of this food is tiny particles known as marine snow. The supply of marine snow is tightly linked to the seasons because during spring and summer, massive blooms of plankton explode at the surface. And as the marine snow falls, it creates a thick layer on the bottom, almost like a carpet, which the benthic animals can then take advantage of. One such epifaunal animal is the sea pig. <laughs> A type of sea cucumber. Unlike most other sea cucumbers which resemble, well, cucumbers, sea pigs look like extraterrestrial hogs because of their extra large tube feet which slowly stir up the sediment as they move through it. This digs up organic particles which the sea pigs feed on and this method of feeding is known as deposit feeding. Now, the sea pigs have an amazing sense of smell and they have a real preference for only the freshest food. So sometimes aggregations of over 500 sea pigs have been spotted all crawling along the seafloor together. As the piggies plough through the sediment, they are freeing up tiny food particles 
but also oxygenating the sediment and creating tiny microhabitat for smaller organisms to live in. This important activity of digging is called bioturbation and it means that the sea pigs are ecosystem engineers, modifying the environment and creating different conditions for other animals to live. Now you might think that sea pigs have to be the weirdest looking sea cucumber, right? But you're wrong. They only won third place in the weirdest sea cucumber competition. Second place went to this guy, the gummy squirrel. And first place went to the headless chicken fish. As well as their unique appearance, sea cucumbers are also interesting because of the way they breathe. Unlike fish, which breathe through gills near their mouth, sea cucumbers actually breathe through their anus. Sea cucumbers have a specialised gas exchange system inside their body called a respiratory tree, and if threatened, some species can actually shoot the tree out in order to startle predators. Sea cucumbers are part of the phylum Echinodermata, which includes some really important other animals on the deep, soft sediments, including these guys, the crinoids or sea lilies. Suspension feeders, like crinoids, like to cling to rocky outcrops, a little bit like oases in the desert, and they will stretch their arms out and trap any small creatures or food particles floating past with mucus. Once caught, these food particles are passed into a groove in the arm and then carried to the mouth using tiny hairs called cilia, a little bit like a conveyor belt. Now crinoids have been on Earth for about 400 million years since the Ordovician period, so they're some of the oldest animals on Earth. Some of them are free swimming, they are known as the feather stars, but the ones down on the abyssal plains tend to anchor themselves to the sediment using a stalk. Nowadays, the biggest crinoids have a stalk about a metre in length, but there is an extinct species of crinoid which had a stalk measuring 40 metres in length. That's about 10 metres long than a big blue whale. The peaceful sea pigs and crinoids are not the only animals lurking in the abyss though because there are far more predatory animals scouring the seafloor looking for their next meal. Long legs crawl across the bottom. This is a pycnogonid, a sea spider. Despite their name, they're not really spiders at all. In fact, their closest living relatives might actually be horseshoe crabs. Now, sea spiders are carnivores. They scour the seafloor looking for their prey soft-bodied animals like anemones. The sea spiders hunt using a straw-like appendage called a proboscis. They stab their prey and then slurp out the soft contents inside, a bit like a smoothie. Admittedly, most sea spiders are tiny, but the largest in the deep sea and polar regions can have legs over 50 centimetres long. Now, I'm not afraid to admit, these are the only sea creatures which do give me the heebie-jeebies. But I am marine bioho, and I try and find something endearing about all the creatures in the sea. So it turns out that these guys have sex with their legs. Sea spiders have special openings on their legs called genital pores. And so when they do the deed, the male and female sort of climb over each other and release their eggs and sperm and then actually the male sea spider will hold on to the eggs and look after them until they hatch so that's quite sweet actually speaking of cute things let's say hello to everybody's favorite the giant isopods beloved by those on the internet giant isopods are very closely related to the wood lice or pill bugs that you can find down in your garden Giant isopods, on the other hand, like to live on sandy and muddy sediments and they've been observed burrowing into the sediment, possibly to lay their eggs. The very largest species can reach lengths of over 50 centimetres 
or about the same size as a chihuahua. So why are they so big? Well, the giant isopod is a scavenger, and so it depends on large meals rather than the abundant marine snow. This means that giant isopods live a lifestyle of feast and famine, gorging themselves on as much food in one go, because the next meal might not be for weeks or even months. In order to accommodate this lifestyle, giant isopods have a giant stomach, which takes up about two thirds of their body, and their bodies also have plentiful fat reserves. Because of this, giant isopods have been known to go several years without food, and several specimens who were kept in an aquarium managed to survive for at least two or three years without food. Another adaptation which helps them is their metabolism. It's pretty cold down in the deep sea, and so their metabolism is really slow and they need a lot less energy. Sadly for the giant isopods though, they don't actually live very deep down, only a maximum depth of around 2000 meters, and that means they aren't quite deep enough to truly be called abyssal animals. Sorry giant isopods. Now so far I've only mentioned invertebrates, and that's because vertebrates, with their high metabolic rates, find it really hard to find enough food to survive amongst the sand and mud. But there are a few vertebrates who manage to make a life for themselves atop the sand and mud. And one of the strangest is the tripod fish. This peculiar looking fish has evolved long extensions on its tail and pelvic fins, which can be up to a metre long. It sits raised above the sediment, simply waiting for food to swim into its mouth. The sensitive fins can also detect the movement of any prey below the tripod fish and neatly sweep it up into the tripod fish's mouth. Now, food is not the only thing that's hard to find on the abyssal plains, because it can also be a girlfriend. In order to solve this problem, tripod fish have come up with an ingenious solution. They're all hermaphrodites. This means that if two tripod fish meet, there's always a guarantee that they can reproduce. This adaptation increases the likelihood of breeding success, but in extreme circumstances, the tripod fish can do something truly remarkable. They can actually fertilize their own eggs. This means it's possible that during its life, a tripod fish can have children having never encountered another member of its species. That means that if you're an incel, you really need to sit down and evaluate your life choices because you don't see any tripod fish complaining. Away from the isolation of the deep sea, we can also find soft sediment habitats much closer to land. In these areas where there's plenty of sunlight and plenty of food, the biggest challenge for organisms is finding somewhere to hide in the featureless wastelands. You might not expect the murky waters of Lembe Strait in Indonesia to hold many secrets, but this seemingly barren landscape supports a surprising array of animals. In fact, many divers and underwater photographers deliberately seek out these soft sediment areas for a special type of diving known as muck diving. The coconut octopus is one of the smartest animals you'll see in the Lembe Strait. This smart little cephalopod is able to hold two halves of a coconut shell together whilst using just two legs to walk along the seafloor, which makes it one of the only known bipedal animals. This amazing method of locomotion might also mimic the movement of a sunken piece of debris, helping to avoid predators. It's also an example of tool use, which just goes to show how smart cephalopods are. But it's not just prey animals who like to hide. Many predators hide from their prey as well. Meet the bobbit worm. This cunning creature can measure up to three meters long, but most of its ginormous length is hidden inside a burrow lined with mucus. 
Despite having extremely poor vision, bobbit worms can use very sensitive antennae on their heads to detect the movement of any nearby fish. And in the blink of an eye, catch the fish and drag them down into its burrow. <coughs> Another terrifying predator is the stargazer. This unique looking fish has adapted to bury itself in the sand and patiently wait for its prey to swim past. Once a fish gets close enough, the stargazer's powerful jaws open and swallow the fish in less time than it takes to blink. Some species even have a lure like an anglerfish that they can wiggle around to mimic a tasty worm and to lure prey. To adapt to this sunken lifestyle, the eyes and the mouth of the stargazer have migrated to the very extremes of its face. And in addition, whilst buried, stargazers can actually breathe through their nostrils instead of through their mouth like most fish. In cartilaginous fish like sharks and rays, special holes called spiracles are used to breathe in. Now on benthic species like stingrays, which like to live on the bottom, the spiracles are right on top of the head or dorsal surface and that allows the animals to lie flat on the bottom very comfortably. Now you might have heard the myth that sharks need to keep swimming in order to breathe and for some species like great whites, this is true, they are what we call obligate ram ventilators so they depend on the swimming to move the water through their mouths but actually most sharks can use something called buckle pumping which is where they basically use their cheeks to breathe and so they can lie on the seafloor and even take naps while still breathing quite happily. Most benthic fish lie with their ventral surface or their tummies against the sediment but the odd ones out are the pleuronectiforms or flatfish. They actually lie on their sides. Flatfish are very famous for their goofy asymmetry but when they're young they actually look like this. As they go through puberty or metamorphosis, it looks like someone's put some stupid TikTok filter on their face and their eye migrates all the way to the side of their yeah. head. Now, some species are dextral or right-sided, like flounders, whereas other species are sinistral or left-sided, like turbot. Now, just because they look a little bit silly doesn't mean that you should underestimate flatfish because the largest of all, the halibut, can grow to be over 300 kilograms. Most flatfish have quite a mottled appearance to camouflage against the seafloor, and some of them can actually change their colour using chromatophores, a little bit like octopuses. However, the four-eyed sole appears to have four eyes on its body, and it's thought that this might try and intimidate predators away or startle them. Another animal who lives on soft sediments, which uses a startle display, is the sea mouse. Despite its name, it looks more like a hedgehog than a mouse. And interestingly, its Latin name comes from the Greek goddess of love, Aphrodite. Sea mice are actually worms and they can grow up to 20 centimetres long. It has these fantastically iridescent bristles called setae and they essentially work a bit like fibre optic cables, flashing and startling any predators who try to eat the sea mouse. Animals that live in sand and mud have to deal with a very ephemeral habitat that's constantly changing and there's quite a lot of variety in terms of what the sediment actually is. Ask any geologist and they will tell you that the differences between gravel, sand and mud are very very specific. As well as the particle size, sediment differs because of what the sediment is actually made of. Some sediment is lithogenous, it's made of eroded rocks. Some sediment is biogenous, 
It's made up of shells and other parts of once living organisms. And some sediment comes from outer space. If there's really strong currents and lots of waves, then you're going to get larger particles of sediment and really hardy creatures. But if the water is a lot more calm, you're going to get much finer sediment and more delicate animals. Different animals also have different methods of digging into the sediment. Starfish basically vibrate. They use all of their tiny tube feet to slowly bury themselves. On the other hand, worms and mollusks basically use a hydraulic system. By contracting different muscle groups at the right time, they can create an anchor and then pull the rest of their body down. Some crustaceans, like mole crabs, wait for waves to liquefy the sand and then they use their back legs to make the hole. All in all, it means that in areas with different sediment, you tend to find quite specific communities of animals. Here in the UK, the government identifies these important habitats and animals in what's called a BAP, a Biodiversity Action Plan. Now, we were the first country in the world to come up with the concept of a BAP all the way back in 1994, and it just goes to show the UK government is fantastic at looking after British biodiversity. <coughs> now, one of the rarest soft sediment habitats in the UK is a habitat called burrowed mud. In this amazing landscape, you can find Norway lobsters or scampi digging burrows filled with tiny shrimp and gobies, sea urchins and brittle stars crawling through the mud, swimming scallops, rare sea squirts and burrowing anemones like the fireworks anemone. Bright green mud volcano worms create giant mounds of mud shaped like volcanoes and giant naked foraminiferans are actually single-celled organisms which look like cottage cheese on the sea floor. The tall sea pen is actually a type of cold water coral and can grow up to two meters long, whilst the phosphorescent sea pen glows blue-green when disturbed by predators. We're now heading to the most familiar sand and mud habitats of all, the intertidal zone. This is where you will find mud flats, salt marshes and mangrove forests. When I was at university, I actually found these habitats the most interesting to study, just because of how much was actually going on underneath the surface. Mudflats are some of the most productive ecosystems on Earth and all of this productivity starts on the mud itself. If you go down to the beach or your local estuary, chances are the mud will probably look quite green and slimy, but this slime is actually quite special. On top of the mud are millions, billions of algae, things like diatoms, and they live in a special mat called a biofilm. As they grow, they secrete sticky substances, which actually help to stabilize the sediment and stop it getting washed away. They also photosynthesize, which creates food for snails, worms, and small fish, and in turn supports larger predators. Now, mud flats might not look very extreme, but they're actually a very harsh habitat to survive in because of the fact that twice a day, the tide does this. The organisms living in mudflats face lots of challenges, but one of the biggest is getting enough oxygen. Lugworms have special red blood cells or haemoglobin, 
which are amazing at binding to oxygen molecules, even when there's very, very low levels of oxygen. And that enables these worms to still breathe normally, even when the tide has gone out. If you've ever gone digging at the beach, you'll know that eventually the sand stops being yellow and turns gray and then black and smelly. And this color change marks the boundary between the layers of sand with oxygen and without. Yellow sand has plenty of oxygen, um, plenty of burrowing animals and oxygen loving bacteria. Whereas the black smelly sand has anaerobic bacteria who thrive without oxygen and produce lots of smelly hydrogen sulfide. The aerobic bacteria need oxygen to survive and for a lot of the anaerobic bacteria, oxygen is actually quite toxic. Now this means that bacteria from the two layers can never meet and fall in love just like Romeo and Juliet. But the layer in between these two zones is very interesting. It's a little bit like the Korean demilitarized zone. It's called the redox discontinuity layer and there are all sorts of fascinating chemical reactions happening here. Now the depth at which the redox discontinuity layer occurs can also indicate what sort of animals you're likely to find in the sand. If the redox discontinuity layer is quite deep, then the sand is well oxygenated, there's probably going to be lots of animals living there. But if it's quite shallow, then only the most hardy animals are going to be able to survive. Now as animals burrow, they are actually helping to oxygenate the sediment. Sometimes the redox discontinuity layer can look like this because of the shapes of animals' burrows. We are now going to travel to another habitat where mud is really important. The mangroves. The unique biology of mangroves means that they are home to some fascinating creatures, from manatees to pygmy sloths, upside down jellyfish, and even tigers. Despite all this richness and biodiversity, mangrove mud is actually very low in nutrients and oxygen. The key to all of the biodiversity in the mangroves is the mangrove trees themselves. Mangrove soil and mud is so low in oxygen that mangrove trees have evolved special roots called pneumatophores, which grow upwards out of the mud and in some cases can grow over two meters tall. The pneumatophores are covered in holes which let oxygen in, but then when the tide comes in, they contain hydrophobic or water repelling substances to keep the water out. Now, mangrove trees are technically land plants, but they're able to survive in salinity as high as 75 parts per thousand, so twice the salinity of seawater. Some species of mangrove tree block salt from entering the vascular system completely, and other species excrete the salt, which can lead to tiny salt crystals on the tree leaves. Now, unlike mud flats, mangrove mud is really poor in nutrients. And this means that most of the animals are dependent on the mangrove trees for their food. One of the most common creatures on the mangroves are snails, which depend on fallen leaves for food. And they have a rather curious strategy to get a meal. If one snail finds a leaf and starts grazing, then the leaf will release chemical cues and all of the other snails are very attracted by these chemical cues to come and graze on the leaf. This might sound confusing because surely that means there's less leaf per snail? Well, it could be that the chemical cues are alerting snails to the freshest leaves or it could be a form of communism. You see, these snails have to compete with a rival on the mangroves the crab. When crabs find a lovely tasty leaf, they will take it away to their burrows and bury it for later, taking it out of the snail's reach. Now one snail isn't a match for a crab, but if all the snails work together and weigh down the leaf, then they can secure their food and the snails will win. 
what was that what was that film what was that film from like the 90s with the with the ants and it was like all socialist com was it literally just called ants anyway we need a sequel to ants about communist mangrove snails mangrove forests as a whole act as a nursery for many species of sharks and fish and they protect our coastlines from storms however like a lot of soft sediment habitats they are under threat from human activity <sighs> human beings are just really good at pummeling the crap out of nature a lot of the biggest threats to soft sediment habitats come from humanity's insatiable appetite for seafood. In the mangroves, we're clearing large areas of forest to make room for shrimp farms, which often use slave labour and can poison the soil. Scallops and scampi are popular dishes, but when heavy duty dredging is used, it can devastate large areas of seafloor. Another problem is salmon farming. Salmon farms can create large amounts of waste which falls to the seafloor and create dead zones with no oxygen where little can survive. Now, this isn't me saying that all seafood is bad, but if you would like to help protect soft sediment habitats, then you can reduce your consumption or look for more sustainable choices. In order to protect these soft sediment habitats, it's really important that us scientists study them even more. There are lots of really cool techniques to study soft sediments. We can use the get yoinked claw, the shaky shaky box, and of course the most fun option is building a mecha and simply going down doing the sampling yourself. Now in the classic YouTube video essay format, I should probably make some grand sweeping statement and summarise my thesis. But the whole point of this video was just to prove that sand and mud can be really cool and there's lots going on underneath the surface. So I encourage you to get out there, explore the world of soft sediment, get your spade and your wellies and see what you can find. What we're doing now then? Uh, yeah, I've just filmed it like an oyster. Shake well, show me on your hand. Them out. It'd be nice if um, we found some amphipods, but. What? What do you mean? Well, they're crustaceans. Yeah.